we're going to read a passage from Acts chapter 2 and verse 37. And um, in this passage, we, we've just had the day of Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit is falling on the earth like never before. And people are responding to the moving of God through the Holy Spirit. The Word is coming alive in their hearts, and they're coming alive to the Word. And we see a picture of a community that really has become drenched in the latter rain, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And um, I've entitled my sermon, Shiny Happy People. And as soon as I mentioned it to Gabriel, he immediately recognised it as a song by R.E.M., Shiny Happy People. And I do like that song, and, um, uh, and that's part of the reason I chose it. Uh, but Scott, who's another minister of, uh, was, was with us when uh, Gabriel mentioned that, and Scott said, never heard that one by R.E.M., Shiny Happy People. He said, the only one I've heard is Losing My Religion. So I said to him, well, you can preach on that one then. I'll stick to shiny, happy people. But the reason I used that title is because we will see uh, in this section that they really were shiny, happy people. Uh, they were happy because they were happy in the Lord. And one of the great things as we respond to the movings of the Holy Spirit in a time of refreshing like this is that we learn to be happy in the Lord. And all the secondary legitimate happinesses that the world can give us, nice food, nice friends, whatever that might be, uh, they sort of like take their rightful place as we realise that true happiness, contentment, fulfilment and hope is found in relationship with the Holy Spirit. They were happy people, but they're also shiny. They were shining and people were noticing that they were different. They were seeing the light of Jesus through them and they wanted to be with them. So as I read this section uh, of scripture, Acts 2.37, Peter just preached the gospel powerfully. Try in your imagination to try imagine the people that were there, what they were experiencing and what it must like to have been in these days. <clears throat> now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent, and each one of you be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So then, those who had received his word were baptised, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing with them all as any might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favour with all the people. And the Lord that was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Later on in Acts chapter 4, these will be called times of refreshing. Times when the Holy Spirit comes in great power in people's lives and brings the kingdom of God nearer than it's ever been before. I've often mentioned that God is as active behind the scenes when we can't feel him or sense him or see him. He's as active behind the scenes as he is when he comes on center stage to manifest his presence and comes close to us. 
And so God works as powerfully when there isn't a season of refreshing as he does when there is a season of refreshing. He has different purposes for different times. Understand, the seasons of God all have their purpose. So in a season where we're feeling the Holy Spirit drawing nearer and closer, as we begin, and it is a journey, of opening our hearts, our lives wide to him, and as he steps closer and closer, this is a time when God wants to do great things in our lives. So when we look at this passage where the Holy Spirit came in great power after Pentecost, we can see principles of what we should expect God to be doing in the coming days and weeks and months so that we can open our heart up even more than we're doing to the work of the Holy Spirit. I've often thought one of the things that we need to learn is what the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives at any given time. Uh, I look back at my old life and sometimes I've found that in my ignorance or, or in my unawareness of what the Holy Spirit was doing, because I didn't know what the Holy Spirit was doing in a season in my life, then how could I cooperate with him? How, how, how could I uh, allow him freedom to do what he was doing when I didn't know what he was doing? Sometimes the Holy Spirit has been doing things in my life uh, and I've actively worked against it. I didn't even know the Holy Spirit was doing it. I thought it was the enemy. And so it helps when we have some signposts on the way that the Holy Spirit is leading us so that we can say, well, in these days, I can open myself up to such principles because these are the types of ways that the Holy Spirit is acting on when he draws near. Just a few principles to pluck out here. I could, we could spend months on this passage, but I've only got minutes. And, and just to give you a sense, you see that Peter had preached the gospel. And the gospel had come to the people coated by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we read that they were pierced or cut to the heart. When the Holy Spirit draws near in a season of refreshing, expect God's word to be more living and more active than ever before. Because the Holy Spirit is the one that takes the scriptures, the preaching of God's word, and applies them to our hearts. You could have the best preacher in the world with the greatest knowledge of the scriptures, but without the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you might go away saying that was a marvelous sermon and my head learned a lot, but it won't change your life. You could have a terrible preacher, someone who could hardly get anything out of his mouth, but he could just say three words, God loves you. And if the Holy Spirit was on that word of truth, God loves you, your life could be transformed forever in a moment. How many of you know when God has spoken a word into your life? Perhaps the scriptures came alive to you. You were reading your scriptures. Let me encourage you, read your scriptures day by day as much as you're able. It's not a legalist. It was as much as you're able because God's going to speak to you through it very specially in this, this, this season. Come to the service, hear the preaching of God's word, because God's going to take that word, whether it be a good sermon or a bad sermon, but God is going to take something in it, and he's going to apply it to you. It's going to stick to you. Be aware of sticky words. I call them sticky words. Words that God speaks that are just for you. It's in the sermon or the Christian book that you're reading. You're listening to a uh, premier uh, praise channel or something like that. And a song just suddenly hits you and ministers to, to you. And it's like, whoa, that was for me. I was driving in my car listening to premier um, praise. And then this song I'd never heard came up by a band I, I, I'd, I'd never heard. Um, I've forgotten the name already. Uh, but it, it was the simple gospel. That was the name of it. And... Uh, uh, United Pursuit, that was the name. United Pursuit. And it hit me. And, I, and, and it touched me. And, and every time the car s sort of stopped where, in the sort of traffic jam, I'm like brushing away tears. And I got people in the two lanes on either side sort of like driving. <laughs> oh dear. Did he have a fight with his wife this morning? <laughs> oh, you know how they are and everything like that. I was just being touched. And the words of that song, and at the right time, God was speaking to me. 
And so here they were cut to the heart. They were pierced. Preacher, uh, Peter was preaching. It wasn't that, that, that he had a, a, a clever sermon, but it was that God was all over it and all in it, and he was preaching a sticky word for that moment, and people were just standing there, wide open, because the Holy Spirit had opened their hearts, and then he'd entered their hearts with his word. In these days, the Holy Spirit is, is, is opening our hearts, touching us, just opening it. It's a process, different for each one of us, and in different ways and at different times, you're going to feel the Holy Spirit just open you up to something. There's going to be a lot more tears in these days. I don't mean tears of sorrow, but tears of being touched by the Lord. Have you ever had tears because you were touched by the Lord? You read a scripture, it touched you so strongly. You praised the Lord, it touched you so strongly that a tear came in your eye. Or you were uh, just, just sitting there and the Holy Spirit just drew near and then you feel his softening work in your heart. I'm telling you this so that you know that when these things happen, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's what he does. He pierces in a nice way. He pierces your heart. He melts your heart. Pierced to the heart, they said, what should we do? And he said, repent. That word is, turn to the one who's pierced your heart. In other words, when God touches your heart in the many ways that he can, don't just think, oh, okay, well, there we go, that, that was nice. But turn in, lean in to what God is doing in your life. If it's a wonderful scripture, if it's a beautiful moment, if it's a time of worship, whatever it is that the Holy Spirit is doing, don't just enjoy it or receive it, but lean into it, pursue it. Ask, what must I do? The Holy Spirit is all over these people. What must I do? And Peter says, repent which simply means lean into God, pursue God, go with God, go with where the Holy Spirit is taking you. And in that particular case, the appropriate thing was for them to be baptized. And we've got people who are leaning into God and being baptized later on into this service. And then he says, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit that was opening their hearts in order to receive the Holy Spirit. Isn't that wonderful? The Holy Spirit opens you up so that you can receive fresh uh, encounters with himself. You know, you can't physically, spiritually, mentally open yourself up to God. You can't do it. What you've got to do is let go, just allow the Holy Spirit to come into your life, and where you perceive him, where anything positive of God touches your life, open, like a flower to the sun's uh, sunlight open yourself to the word open yourself to the leading open yourself to the command open yourself the holy spirit is touching convicting encouraging blessing and as he does that he's doing that to open you he's healing us on the inside so that we can be more open to what receive more of him he's the beginning and the end of your christian experience he is god on earth Without the Holy Spirit, you don't have the Father. Without the Holy Spirit, you can't understand the Word. Without the Holy Spirit, Jesus does not draw near, and you don't draw near to him. That's why Peter said, hey, you know, turn into God and get the greatest gift that you can possibly ever have on earth. What is the greatest gift that anybody can receive on the earth? It's the Holy Spirit and to keep receiving and keep being open to his daily ministry in our lives. It's the greatest gift. This is why we'll see that they became so happy. They were shiny, happy people because they were happy in the Lord because they'd got the greatest gift that anybody can ever receive, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Do you remember the Lord's Prayer? And then after the Lord's Prayer, Jesus taught, seek and keep seeking, ask and keep asking, knock and keep knocking, knowing that the Lord's Prayer wasn't enough. You can't just pray it once and then think you're going to get the answer. Jesus said, keep praying the things in the Lord's Prayer. Keep asking and asking and asking and asking, seek and seek and seeking, knock and knock and knocking, because in the process of doing the knocking and the knocking and the seeking and the seeking and the asking and the asking, God is opening your heart ready to receive the answer. And what is the answer? You're seeking God for this, you're seeking God for that, you're asking God for the other. And, uh, and, and Jesus says, don't give up, just remember that your father is good and he's in heaven. 
He gives good gifts to his children. He doesn't give scorpions and stones and snakes, but he gives bread and eggs and fish. Any human being that's a good parent would always give the children the good things that they ask for. But then Luke says this, uh, Matthew says, and he'll give good gifts to his children. Keep seeking, keep knocking, keep asking. But Luke sums it up in a different way. Jesus, at a different time, when he preached that sermon, said, said this, he said, and will he not give the Holy Spirit to everyone who asks? Look, there are many things that you need in your life. What do you need in your life right now? What's on your prayer list for God? What things do you think will make you happy? Legitimate things, material things, relational things, career things, educational things. What things would you ask of the Lord and ask him? What, what's on your prayer list today? But I can tell you, as legitimate as those things are, and keep asking, keep knock, knocking, keep seeking, don't give up, the greatest thing that you can receive in your circumstance and your situation and your personhood is more of God, more of the Holy Spirit. You know, what does it profit us if we hold on to the things that we can't keep and reject the one thing that can give us the peace, the hope, the security that we need in this broken world while we are pilgrims among it? High levels of the Holy Spirit's activity in our lives and responsiveness to him will put you in the best position to, tra to traverse the obstacles and difficulties on life's journey. Many of us are struggling in a way that we don't need to struggle if we trusted the Lord by the help of the Holy Spirit and he came deep within our lives. And so there was a focus of these great people. And, and Peter said, be saved from this perverse generation, in verse 40. Actually, the word is, you save yourself from this perverse uh, uh, situation. It says, escape from the perverse uh, generation. So there is a turning away from the perversity of life that, that surround us. The word for uh, perverse is a Greek word called scolios. You ever heard of the condition, um, was it scoli... <laughs> Scoliosis, thank you, I forgot it, you know, you, you do know it. Sco well, that comes from this word, you know, which talks about the back and everything, a bit of there being something that's twisted, not right. And so we need to realise that the world's got nothing to offer us. No, really, it hasn't, not compared to what God has got, off, got to offer us, and that's his Holy Spirit, his person. Because when the Holy Spirit comes, he brings everything with him. He brings the word, he brings wisdom, he brings gifts, he, he brings character development, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. He brings Jesus and the things Jesus said. He brings intimacy with the Father. He, he doesn't boast of his own, but he brings to you Jesus. He brings to you. So when we open ourselves to the Holy Spirit, we're just simply saying more kingdom and more God. And there is a focus. In these days, can I encourage you, if you want to be a shiny, happy people, we'll get there. We're getting there. If you want to be a shiny, shining for Jesus, if you want to be happy, happy in the Lord, then let us have the same focus that they had during this time of great Holy Spirit visitation. It says in verse 42, they continually, not once off, but continually in a learnt lifestyle, devoted, devoted, focused themselves on what? The apostles' teaching. The word that will set us free. They loved the word. They were in the word and the word was in them. When the Holy Spirit touches our lives, if it's truly the Holy Spirit and we're truly responding to him, the word's going to mean a lot more to us. The scriptures, the word is going to become even more precious because it's going to be doing such a powerful work, living and active, shaping and changing us. The word of God is living and active. It's like a two-edged sword, isn't it? Hebrews 4 says, I like to put it this way in a modern way. The word of God is living and active like a scalpel in the Holy Ghost surgeon's hand. He operates on our heart to heal us and to strengthen us and to make us everything he wants us to be. Devote them to the teaching, to the fellowship. 
fellowship, the word here is koinonia in the Greek, because the New Testament was originally written in Greek. That's why we sometimes go back to the word. Now, koinonia, when we talk about fellowship, we're not talking about the fellowship I used to have at my church when I lived in Harrogate as a young boy. Fellowship was tea and biscuits with the vicar at the end. This is more than that, although that was, that was lots of fun. Actually, it wasn't, but anyway. Not for a 16-year-old boy who didn't even want to be there in the first place. Another story, another time. Koinonius is partnership with a purpose. So during this time, we should expect to partner together in intercession, in good works, in cell ministry, in whatever God has called us in the marketplace, we should be expecting something to take place. The kingdom's going to advance on all fronts. When the Holy Spirit comes to a people who are increasingly open to him, the kingdom of God advances on all fronts. I like that. In the Napoleonic Wars, when, uh, when the army broke through and it, they, the, the moment of the battle had been won, at the moment the battle had been won, the trumpets would sound, the drums would roll, advance on all fronts. Take the ground. And the Holy Spirit comes and brings the victory. We can expect advancements in very many areas of our lives. Yes, there will be opposition. Yes, there will be fleshly things to be dealt with. But all those things that arise, the flesh, temptation, the work of the enemy, they're all being brought out in the open to be dealt with victoriously by the Holy Spirit. So if during this season you start feeling a bit bad about yourself, you start struggling, with some issues, some old issues pop up. Or you start thinking about yourself, you know what, I'm looking at myself and I'm, I'm less happy with who I am than I've ever been. Don't worry, be encouraged. Again, you need to know what the Holy Spirit is doing. He's bringing things up so that he can get them out of our lives. So if bad things come up, if difficulties happen in this season, know that the Holy Spirit is at work. He's manifesting these things so that they don't remain hidden, but that they can be brought out and dealt with. Some of the greatest works of the Holy Spirit in my life have been at times when I've felt so bad about myself. But I have learnt, and I'm still learning, that in those days now, when I feel really bad about myself, when I feel unholy, when I feel I can't be used, when I feel, I feel oh no, not this again, when I feel I blew that, now I'm learning not, not to be too despondent, but to say, ah, this is the Holy Spirit doing a deep work, bringing up impurities that he's left for a while because he was doing other things in my life, but now these things are coming up so that he can deal with them. And invariably, during times where I don't feel good about myself, I've learned that God is doing a deep work, and invariably, his encouragement helps me through that period, and I come out stronger, more refined, and more closer to God, and more whole in myself than I have been before. So that's a word for any of you, that in these times where we're saying there's a new season, you say, a new season, I've never struggled so much in my inner life, ever. It's the new season, but the new season's not going to leave you in struggle. The new season has brought the struggle to the surface so that it can be dealt with. Be encouraged, the Holy Spirit is at work. So koinonia, fellowship, partnership together, to see greater power on the gospel and on our lives. And breaking of bread, one another, fellowship, being there for one another, and to prayer. We could go into that in more detail, but these are just signposts on the way. They felt a sense of awe in verse 43. That's a sense of fear. Not being scared, but being in the presence of somebody that is pretty powerful. I mean, is there anybody that, that you would feel very... Uh, Oh, what's, what's the word? Nervous to be in the presence of. I don't know, it'll be different for each one of us. What if you're going to meet the Queen of England tomorrow? How would you feel? What if you were going to meet President Obama and his wife? How would you feel about that? Or a great sportsman? Just somebody that means... Would you feel nervous about meeting them because in your mind they were great people? Well, when the Holy Spirit comes close to us, there's intimacy, there's fellowship, there's friendship, but there's also an awareness that Jesus is not just the lamb, but the lion. One of the things our senior leader said about the move of the Holy Spirit in these coming days is that there would be a focus on the lion and the lamb. 
It's like they say in that, the book on Narnia, um, Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, and uh, one of the girls, Lucy or the other, um, I think it's the other, says to um, um, the beaver, Mr. Beaver, about when he speaks about Aslan, the king, and, uh, and the beaver replies, is he safe? Whoever said anything about being safe? But he's, I'm asking you because of it. He's, he's kind, isn't it? He's kind. He's kind. So it's knowing the kindness, but also this sense of, wow, the Holy Spirit can do what, whatever he wants. Now let, let's get to the place. Day by day, with one mind in the temple, they're breaking the bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness. Here's the happy part. They were glad. They were happy. What was this happiness, these happy people? Well, they were happy because the God was with them. And they had a sense of gratitude because they were so grateful that they'd been saved. So grateful that they weren't going to hell, but they were going to heaven. So grateful that God was with them, that God inhabited their praise, that they could sense him close to him. And they had joy. They were praising God and they were happy in the Lord. God, in these times, was enough. They had a taste of heaven and they were enjoying it. They had increasingly turned from the twisted generation that they were in and they had found that there was a new kingdom, a new experience, a washing and a cleansing and a healing and also that what God was doing in them, he was also doing with other people that they, they had met. And this gladness and this happiness now, Psalm 37, verse 3 and 4 says this. Psalm 37, verse 3 and 4 in the New Life Version says, Trust in the Lord and do good, so that you will live in the land and well, will be fed. Be happy in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Happiness in the Lord. The Holy Spirit is seeking to wean us of things that give us Temporary pleasure, wh whether legitimate or not legitimate, that would be sin. Temporary pleasures, and to put us on something that is solid, solid food. Some, someone who can be relied on, someone who's there for us, someone who can be trusted, someone we can spend time with. They'd learn to be happy in the Lord, to transfer their focal point of need from earthly things and people that pass away and fail to begin to transfer that to trust in the Lord, to devotion to the Lord, to following the Lord. And as they did that, something went on inside them and they had a happiness. You know, when you look at church history, some of the happiest Christians that you ever met have gone through some of the greatest difficulties. Later on in Acts chapter 8, this group of happy, shining people would suddenly be blown on by the Holy Spirit through persecution out of Jerusalem. And when they went out, because they were happy in the Lord, they took their happiness in the gospel and the Lord wherever they went. They shone wherever they went. They were happy. He was enough. God, you can't make this happen, but you can be aware of it and respond. God's going to give you the joy of the Holy Spirit. In many, and that comes in many various ways and for, forms. But you're going to find a happiness. Some of you believe that have been around the block a few times. Have you ever been in a very difficult place, but you're so happy that God is with you? Have you ever been in a place where God has allowed you to be stripped down and, that, and taken away all the things that you've been trusting in, where you feel nothing, you've got nothing, you feel... That, that, that all you've got is God, and yet deep down inside, although you miss the things that have happened, or the things that you've lost, or still a great pain, something inside you says, but at least I've found you in a deeper way. You know what I'm saying? Some of the most difficult times that we go through are some of the times when we get close to, Lord, to the Lord, and there's a closeness, there's a leaning, that there's a relationship. Just like a friend who's there when you really need them, you know, you can have many friends, but a friend that's really near you, 
I don't know about you, but there's been times when I've been very humbled by friends that have been there for me. In fact, after I've been having a difficult time, and I'm, I actually get embarrassed because they're there again and I want to lean on them. And I'm thinking, I'm telling them all again about my difficulties. And I'm feeling a bit bad, you know, shouldn't I be hearing from them? And, but, but they're saying, look, just, just, we're here for you. We want to hear from you. We're, we're supporting you. Have you ever had a friend like that? If not, friends are coming. And you be a friend. And at those times, you go away and you're so grateful because that friend was there, whatever cost, really was there. Well, the Holy Spirit is the greatest friend that you could ever had. That's why they were happy in the Lord. They were happy and they were simple. It says that they shared their meals together with gladness, and you can say sincerity of heart, but the word is simplicity. If you want to receive the kingdom of God, we must become like a little child. That childlike faith is not throwing your brains away. It's not, it's not not thinking through issues. But there's a sense of coming before God and the Holy Spirit simply. Simple worship. A simplicity of heart. An honesty of heart before God and before one another. These things are beautiful. The most beautiful Christian that you can meet is someone that has a simple, honest heart. Simple and honest before God and simple and honest. You know, an Israelite within which there was no guile. Get simple before the Lord. Get childlike before the Lord and you will mature because the kingdom of God comes to such as these. Shiny. They were happy and they were shiny. It wasn't just that God was blessing them, but they were having an impact wherever they went. They had favour with God. God was on them. They had favour in the workplace, favour with the finances, favour in the neighbourhood. They had favour with the tubes, favour with the taxis, favour with the Ubers. They had everywhere they went, there was a favour upon them. I'm not saying that they didn't experience difficulties, but God was on them. And whatever they did in him, it prospered. You know, sometimes you can be doing one thing for the Lord and it's right and nothing really happens and then for no reason at all, God just decides to bless you. You know, you can be worshipping the Lord, we can be going together uh, at services, worshipping the Lord and, and all that's wonderful and then for no reason at all, the Holy Spirit inhabits our worship in a different way. It's God's favour. You can't earn God's favour, but you can discern God's favour. Some of us, things are going to change. You're going to try things you've tried before, and this time it's going to have a lot more fruit. You're going to feel a sense of burden to pray for someone to be saved that you've prayed for before. But this time, there's going to be a difference. They're going to be pierced in the heart by the Holy Spirit. Now is a time, not only to continue to do the things that we've done before, but with greater favour, but also to try things over again. It could be things that you've tried in the past, try again. Phone them again. Invite them out again. The Holy Spirit, in His time and His way, I'm just saying this is a discerning journey. I'm not saying everything's going to work out for you perfectly, but I'm saying be, be ready for the God moment. Be ready for people to be different than they've been different before because the favour's upon you. Be ready to speak. Be ready to do acts of love and kindness that you haven't been ready before because you thought no difference last time. It's going to make a difference. Now's the time when your boss may be different. That takes a lot of faith. I'm not for me, but that takes a lot of faith for you. <laughs> Now's the time for you to reach. Now's the time. I'm not saying how or what the Holy Spirit will lead you, but would you be open to the favour of God? Would you be open to new doors being opened? Would you be open to people being different than they were before, not the same, and responding to you in a different way because the favour's on you? If you just open yourself up to some of the things that I'm saying on this sermon, then you will discern God's work in your life in these days, and you won't be going, what's going on, I don't understand, or missing the moment of God's grace, but you'll be going, ah, Ah, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Favour of all people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day was being saved. It was a work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was not just working in the church that had got saved, this wonderful work that we've been speaking about. But the Holy Spirit, when he draws near, he starts drawing near to the unsaved. Visiting the neighbourhoods. 
when the Holy Spirit comes to his church, he overflows into those that don't yet know him. How many of you know God has got many, many people in this city that he hasn't yet brought to himself? Said earlier that all the, it said earlier in the passage, all that the Lord had brought to them. 